thanks, Tony, and thanks to everyone who organized the conference. Thank, thank you all for um, coming. Um, let me start with just a, a minute about me. I've been in the database space for almost 20 years. I was at Oracle for nine years. I did a bunch of different jobs there. I ran the e-commerce applications as the chief applications architect. So I saw the database mostly from the perspective of somebody trying to build applications on it and building some of the newer applications. Uh, I then spent seven years at, at Mark Logic and then the most recent three years at uh, TenGen. I don't like the fact that I'm old enough to have been in the database industry for 20 years, but I'm actually the same age as the relational database. And so all, all this gray hair uh, on me, I think, is symbolic of, of maybe a time for some change in, in the industry. Um, my background, I'm really sort of a geek turned business person, but I'm, I'm going to not talk about the bits and bytes here. I'm going to talk about the industry trends. Um, so. Uh, I want to talk about where I think the industry is, where we're going. Uh, this will not be like the roadmap of features that are coming in MongoDB. It's not going to be an advertisement for one, Mongo, uh, one uh, NoSQL product over another. I will tell some customer stories to illustrate points that, that are MongoDB related, but, but you should take those as examples of what I think is going on across an industry. So we'll start with with uh, some history and why I think now is, is a time that this industry is really going to change. Where we are today and then where this industry might go and, and how we can all help to, to bring it to, I think, where, where it deserves to be. I think we're at a really interesting moment in the history of the database industry and I think the people in this room the, the vendors and the users will all play a big role in, in charting how the industry evolves over the next few years. So I'm going to start history uh, before the invention of the relational database. Uh, this guy on the screen is uh, Opabinia. It's about 540 million years ago, and it lived during a time known as the uh, Cam Cambrian Explosion. There, there was uh, life on Earth for a long time. That, that really was, was relatively uniform, single cellular. And, and then in a period a, after life was around for a couple of billion years, uh, of a few tens of millions of years, order of magnitude a percent of the time that life had been on Earth, there was this explosion of diversity that, that came onto the scene where the vast majority of the, the body plans that plants and animals have today were formed in that window of time of a few tens of millions of years about half a billion years ago. Now, I don't know, and I don't know that anyone knows for sure, I'm, I'm not a biologist, um, what it was in the environment that caused all that change to happen in that narrow window. Uh, you know, people talk about temperature changes, changes in the composition of, of the atmosphere, et cetera, that, that affected the balance of, of the ecosystem in which all, all these organisms lived and caused a very rapid evolution. I think what's going on today is, is that there have been a bunch of changes in the computing landscape that I'll talk about that are now causing a very rapid evolution of, of database technology. Now, Biological and technological evolution are, are similar in some ways, they're different in other ways, right? They're, they're similar in that the innovations that occur, whether they're in the plan of an animal's body and how it lives its life or a piece of technology that we use, succeed or fail based on how well adapted they are to the environment in which that, that organism lives or in, in which that, that software operates. So, uh, and, and there are many changes going on at the same time that, that are part of a complex equilibrium where a new technology comes on the scene and that affects all the other technologies uh, with which it interoperates. Now, uh, one thing that's different, I should say, is that with biology, there's this constant stream of mutations at a relatively stable rate and the rate of change is determined by how many of those are actually successful. 
in technology, there are other factors that actually also affect the pace of innovation that, that's occurring and how many new things come on the scene, right? How much money venture capitalists are giving out and uh, you know, pe people's belief that they can start a company, that they can innovate. There are a lot of other factors that influence things in technology, but a lot of it comes down to the environment in which people live and that complex equilibrium uh, with, with the rest of their ecosystem. So, um, I'll fast forward now to 1970, and, and to just get us in that mode of 1970, uh, the guy on the screen is Marty Cooper, who invented the cell phone. Actually, in 1970, it was still a prototype. I think that phone is from 1972 or 1973, but it sets the spirit uh, uh, of the time. It was a very different world. Uh, and the, the way in which we interacted with computers w was very different, right? So this is the way that we interacted with computers when the relational database was invented. So that's a job control card from the top of a punch card deck from the Columbia University Computer Center. Now I know we're starting to get terminals there. I think DEC had just introduced the VT50, this futuristic thing with a, with a keyboard and a screen that could actually show you know, letters on it. Um, uh, but that was an innovation that most people didn't have access to when, when they interacted with computers in 1970. So very different ecosystem. Um, I'm gonna fast forward now, and I'm gonna fast forward through an era that I think we're all familiar with, and I'm, um, to 2003, 10 years ago, and the, the very beginning of, of the smartphone, right? So here, here's a Blackberry, uh, now, now 10 years old. And, and now we interact with computers on iPhones, and maybe soon we'll, we'll interact with computers uh, on something like Google Glass. So the ecosystem in which the, these uh, computers are, are working, the software, the databases, is very, very different. In particular, uh, the way people develop applications has, has changed dramatically, uh, most acutely in the last decade. Right? Uh, the types of data that are a part of, of our applications world are much, much broader. <laughs> The, the way we develop is much more iterative, much faster. People want to push out new functionality uh, every week, every day, sometimes uh, by the hour. Uh, it gets deployed into cloud-style environments, consumed on mobile devices, and many of the decisions are made by developers, right? The decision-making around software development is much more decentralized. It's a very, very different in environment than it was uh, when the relational database was invented, uh, and many of the decisions around the design of the relational database are not well optimized for this environment. So, um, so you know, as, as you try to use a tool that, that was designed for maybe running payroll for a few thousand employees to track social media mentions all, all over the internet, right, a, a lot of things begin to break down. And so here are some of what I see as the symptoms of, of the, the breakdown of, of the relational database uh, in attempting to solve many of today's problems. Now, I'm not here to say that the relational database doesn't have a place. If I were building a payroll system, an accounts payable system, an accounts receivable system, I would use a relational database. I think it's well suited for that type of application and that type of data. That's just not a lot of the applications that we're building today. Um, so, you know, w one of the things that, that we learn very early as we're trying to build applications is to try to avoid hitting the database wh wherever we can. So we put caches in front of it, we pre-build the pages, people build sophisticated caching infrastructures where they can keep track of different versions of the page based on whether you're logged into the site or not, right? All, all, all of this to avoid hitting the database. Then meanwhile, we also have this well-developed science of, of how do we normalize a, da uh, a database, first, second, third, fourth, normal form, et cetera, but then we denormalize it for performance reasons. We build these complex data models, but then we use these tools to map our objects to them because they're too complex for, for us to understand. We manually shard our, our systems. The whole, the whole development environment becomes very complex because we're doing a lot to work around a database that can't deal with the volume, velocity, and variety of data that our applications demand. Uh, it creates a lot of rigidity. It creates data in silos. I was um, 
uh, talking to my dad the other day who had bought a couch and decided that, that it wasn't the right one. And so he uh, called Restoration Hardware to return the couch. And the first question that they asked him was, did you buy it in the store, online, or over the phone? Because those orders were in different systems according to how you'd bought the couch. And he scratches his head, I can't remember, let's see. I went into the store and I saw it and then I called you and then I looked on the web. I'm not sure, I think I maybe bought it on the web, right? There's no reason that this data has to be siloed, but the systems today aren't as flexible as, as we need them to be to do business in, in the way we want to do business. Um, uh, I thought I'd illustrate uh, the, the complexity that we create. This is a relational data model. I apologize for the small font, but I was trying to get it on, onto the screen. Uh, it, it's uh, something out of the biotech industry. It's actually something, I'll credit IBM uh, for, uh, for doing this, and, and it's actually, their example was how much simpler this would be in XML, right? And, and they had a very simple XML structure that modeled all of this. Now whether the answer is XML or JSON or, or wide columns, the point is that we're often using a tool that, that's ill-suited to the job that we're trying to solve. Making a developer understand this and code against this is a recipe for an application's taking a long time and, and having a lot of bugs, right? Um, so, uh, so people, I think, have begun questioning a bunch of things. First of all, do I even want a database? Uh, do, do I want an appliance? What's the right data model? How am I gonna deploy this? Uh, can I take advantage of in-memory? What should the consistency model be? Everything's been kind of open for debate in a way that it hasn't for, for most of the last few decades. Um, and NoSQL was born out of a set of choices in response to some of those questions where people said, we need a different data model. We need a distributed architecture. Most of the people who, who would be considered a part of NoSQL said that it should be open source, that there should be some rethinking of transaction semantics and some form of new query language. I think the naming is unfortunate because the, the query language change is, in my opinion, the least important change uh, of everything that's being rethought in databases, but, but that's where the name for, for NoSQL came from. This is what I think uh, uh, the NoSQL databases have in common. Uh, uh, the, the great news from my perspective, and I think from a user perspective as well, is that, that the NoSQL space has been growing very quickly. So this is a chart that I took from Indeed.com. Uh, they go through job posts and, and organize them online. Uh, and the orange line is the portion of all the job posts that mention RDBMS somewhere. And the blue line is the portion that mention NoSQL. Now, I, I'm, I'm not trying to say that we're now at 80 or 90% of the usage level of, of the relational database. I think the, that uh, many of the relational uh, database jobs mentioned specific vendors and there may have been greater specific desire for NoSQL skills because they're new. But the point is that there's a lot of growth and uh, it's a material portion of the market now. There was a study from uh, 451 Group recently that talked, I think, about 18% of the respondents were using MongoDB. If you expand that to include NoSQL as a whole, it became quite large. So there's a lot of growth in the sector. You've probably heard of most all of these companies and some of how they use NoSQL, pioneered at Google and Amazon and adopted by a lot of the other high profile web companies. What you're probably hearing now uh, for the first time in the last year is some of the big traditional enterprises also using NoSQL. Uh, companies like MetLife, Goldman Sachs, Telefonica, UK government. I don't have time to go into all of these in detail, but I thought I'd just uh, tell the story of MetLife and their usage of NoSQL, because MetLife is a very different type of company than, than Amazon or, or Google. It's, uh, uh, been around for a long time. Uh, they have had 70 different systems that contained policy information, right? So uh, when you called up 
to, to get customer service. They had 24 different call centers because they couldn't train one agent on all 70 systems. Uh, and that agent would have to track down your information across a variety of systems based on the type of policy that you had, how, how you bought it, their history of acquisitions, uh, et cetera. Um, uh, they'd been trying for years to, to get that data into one system, right? And, and this is not a, a problem that's unique to MetLife. It's not a problem that, that's unique to, to restoration hardware in the case of, of my dad uh, calling them about his purchase. Uh, this is a, a problem that, that's common across many industries uh, and many users. And the challenge is that, that when you have to design that, that data model, and you have to get it just right to accommodate every field that you have, and you're consolidating 70 different systems, and each one of those 70 systems is changing. You do your two-year project, and, and when you're done and you're ready to roll it out, you find out that 11 of the 70 systems have changed, right? And so you go to revise it to catch up with those changes, and nine of them you can handle pretty easily, but two of them are a real hassle, and it takes you six months, and then four more systems have changed, and you just never quite catch up to, to the current state. They were able to, in 90 days, get all their data into one system with MongoDB and roll that out to an initial set of users. My favorite part of the story was the reaction of the users when, when they started having access to all the data in one place. The colleagues who didn't have access would start IMing the, their friends who were using the new system, saying, hey, I've got a customer on the phone and I'm trying to find their policy. Can you look it up for me? Right? That, that's a sign of, of a successful system. I think that type of business impact to be able to go in in three months and transform the way that they interact with, with their customers is a tremendous opportunity. And I look forward o over the coming years to, to doing projects like this uh, across m many customers and uh, many industries. So I think we're, we're starting to get some momentum here. Um, it, there are a bunch of the bigger players in the industry are, are beginning to take notice, mo most of them in a way that I view as very, very positive. Right? So wh whether it's IBM partnering with us around uh, NoSQL query languages or Microsoft working to get NoSQL solutions in Azure, um, Rackspace um, and Amazon doing hosting, integration with tools from ClickTech and Informatica, right? we're, we're building that ecosystem where a user who wants to run their servers at Rackspace and integrate their data with Informatica and do reporting with ClickTech and plug into uh, you know, Red Hat's security architecture, all of that stuff is beginning to, to work together. Uh, you know, we see Oracle announcing pricing models and things like that that look more like the rest of the NoSQL uh, market. It's great. Um, we do have some competition from the big players now. I welcome that. I think it's great. I think it's inevitable. I think it's good for the industry and good for all of you. Um, I will just uh, put, put up a quote from Gandhi. First, they ignore you. That was what happened to NoSQL uh, probably three or four years ago. I think a couple of years ago, uh, it was being ridiculed. Uh, now we've got a bunch of Oracle talks. We've got some uh, 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 products from, uh, from a bunch of, of the leading vendors, and we, we've got a, a battle in the marketplace. I think it's great. I hope that uh, some of us new insurgents will win, but uh, may, may the best man win who, who delivers the, the best solution to all of you. Uh, there's lots of work to do before NoSQL as, as a sector can, can win, right? And before we can get from you know, that, that 15 or 20% usage to something that's used across all the organizations uh, that, the, that have large scale IT needs. So security, there are tons of requirements around security from in encryption of data at risk and as it's traveling to integration with, with you know, Kerberos and LDAP, fine-grained access control, how we do roles and permissions, various certifications, years and years and years of work to do on security. I think each of the vendors may be in, in a slightly different spot. I know many vendors have put a lot of work in, into this and made a lot of progress and people deploy systems for which security is an important concern, but, but we could make it much, much easier 
for, for all of you, so that the 80% who, who wait for something to be fully baked are, will, will come on board. Uh, similarly, manageability integrations, I think the fragmentation and lack of standardization in the market, the uh, uh, skill base is growing rapidly. You find over 50,000 people on LinkedIn with MongoDB somewhere in their profile. 50,000 is still a small portion of all the developers that are out there. A lot of work still to do. I talked about how there's this framework around first, second, third, fourth normal form. There's not the same thing for all these different types of data models in different ways that, that people have to mo model data. There's a lot of maturity that still needs to come into the ecosystem for us to get from that 20% adoption level to the 100% adoption level. There, there are two challenges, by the way, that we face as we do that. We need to make it accessible. We need to do all the things that people will be allowed to use it at the same time that, that we actually make it better and delight the users, right? Make it easier to do queries, make it possible to query different types of things in, in uh, new ways. Uh, but we should not underestimate the importance of checking all those checkboxes so that people are allowed to use the technology in big organizations, right? That's what's held us back and why we're just beginning, I think, to get into organizations like MetLife and, and Goldman Sachs. Uh, uh, so you know, the, the rules around the usage of new technology matter a lot in the adoption of new technology. This is a snippet of the Locomotive Act of 1861 that was passed in the United Kingdom when people uh, you know, were building these things that were kind of a hybrid between a train and a car, right? Like imagine a big steam engine on wheels and people trying to drive it through town. So they decided that this needed regulation, some things like you couldn't drive it more than five miles an hour. I think you had to have someone walking in front of it and waving a flag to warn people, right? So, so when, when you put those limits uh, on the technology, and unsurprisingly, it, it turned out not to be very useful in that regulatory environment. Thankfully, over the coming decades, the, the regulations loosened up as the technology matured, and uh, we, we wound up with, with the automobile. But there, there are a couple of different uh, directions. I think there's a lot of momentum around NoSQL, and, and it could turn into something great, right? You, you look at uh, the Tesla, I think the electric car is gonna revolutionize uh, automobiles. I think it will be absolutely the, the way things look 20 years from now. But, but these early innovations, you don't know exactly how they're gonna turn out, right? Uh, remember the Segway and how that was gonna revolutionize transportation? So it didn't quite revolutionize it as broadly as maybe was hoped at, at the time. I think there are a lot of things that, that go into that. How many of you ever tried riding a Segway? Okay, um, th this picture is not me, but this is what happened when I tried riding one. <laughs> so I think customer success is really important to the adoption of, of these new technologies. If people can use NoSQL databases, they can be productive, they, they can build great applications that, that move their organizations forward, they're gonna tell their friends about it and their friends are, are gonna wanna use it. If people try them and they kind of fall off, as in this picture, they're, they're either not gonna talk about it or they're gonna talk about it in a negative way and, and it's not gonna be on the same growth trajectory. So I think the single most important thing for, for the development of this industry is the success of, of customers in using the technology. Um, I think that success is, is a team effort. Uh, we need to invest a, as vendors aggressively in the product in, in making it both better and more compliant with all the checkboxes. We need to value user success over short-term monetization, right? If we don't make the free open source downloads well tested and solid, right? And we try to say, well, if you wanna do something real, you better come to us and pay, then the industry will never take, take off, right? We built a bunch of online training. It's been tremendously popular. We made it available for free and, and we've had roughly 100,000 people uh, sign up for, for that online training. I think it's been great since launching that training. 
the, the quality of the questions we get back about MongoDB, the number of things that people do that, that, that uh, are shooting themselves in the foot has materially diminished. So I think it's really important for all of us as vendors to invest in customer success, even if it cannibalizes what could have been a, a revenue stream around that training. Uh, the other thing that I think we need to do is we need to, each of us as vendors, be, be true to the essence of what we've built, right? And not get excited about chasing someone else or something else. Understand not just what our product sort of kind of can do, but what our products can do better than anything else out there. And, and focus on that and find users that want to do that, that, that are going to be delighted with, with their experience. Uh, with, with the products. And then we need to build an ecosystem to complement the product. There is so much to do. We cannot do it ourselves. We need to make sure that, that all, all the vendors out there that users rely on for different pieces of, of their solution interoperate with, with our technologies. Um, from, from the customer side, um, uh, if I look at the, the successes and uh, less than successes that, that I've seen out there in the wild. I think, first of all, using the right tool for, for the job, right? And not just bringing in a NoSQL database because it's cool, because you want to learn it, but bring it in where, where it's really going to be impactful for that project. And think strategically about where to start. Because if this is something that has the potential to, to have a huge impact on how you build applications or over the next five years, start with a win, right? Start with something that's, that's gonna be a huge success, that's gonna be visible, right? If, if you're a manager, think about the personality of the team and think about who's gonna be a good evangelist and advocate for, for the technology as well as a good implementer. Invest in training your team and don't hesitate to, to ask uh, for help from the vendors. Now, one of the challenges that I think we face in, in working together as vendors and as users is a history of win-lose negotiations, right? The, the enterprise software world, uh, unfortunately, I think for both parties, I think it can look appealing from the vendor side, but in the long term, it's not a good thing. Um, when a customer selects a product and deploys on your product, they, they become captive. Right, and captive customers can become fearful and withdraw from the type of collaborative engagement with a vendor that, that can make them successful and, and that can make the, the product better, right? The, the relationships that, that I love with customers are, are with the customers who've done great things and want to do more like them, right? And they want to share with us what worked and, and what didn't work, and they want to partner to figure out how they can have more of that success, right? Unfortunately, so many customers have been trained uh, over decades by, by vendors that really the only conversations they should have with us are how can we have the same uh, quantity for a 10% lower unit price, right? And I think one of the things I'm excited about is because we're doing this in, in an open source approach, uh, the customers have more power. We have to earn customers' business every year. Uh, the, that creates less of that fear, less of that withdrawal. Uh, low prices and high value create that alignment around success that I think will create some true collaboration. So I'm, I'm really excited about where the industry is right now. I think that, that we have an opportunity to transition a major part of the technology stack to open source. I think as we do that, we can try to remake the, the vendor and client relationship in a much more uh, collaborative way. I think we can reinvent the database industry that it'll look completely different in 10 years than, than it does today in terms of who are the players, what's the share, what's the business model, how people feel about those vendors. I think we, we can create an agility and application development that, that really rejuvenates IT's relationship with the business, where, where all of our colleagues in IT out there can surprise and delight your users by delivering things quickly that, that they love. So that, that's why I'm excited about the industry. I'm really excited about the journey that, uh, that we're all on together. 
uh, thank you all for coming. I think I'm out of time. Thank you, Max. Um, let's not miss the opportunity, though, to pose a couple of questions. Great. So if anybody has one, just raise your hand. We'll get the mic to you. I can't believe nobody's willing to challenge anything. All right. One over here on your right. So what do the database market look like 10 years from now? Um, uh, I think it'll actually be smaller th than it is today. Right? It's a market that's 30 or $40 billion, but I meet too many customers that are unhappy with how much they're paying. So it might be a, a $20 billion market instead of a 30 or $40 billion market. I think relational will be a big part of the market, but not yeah. dominant in the way it is today. Relational might be half. If, if we're successful, I would love NoSQL to be 60 or 70%, relational 30 or 40, less so maybe the other way around. Far left there. Uh, thank you very much. It was a very good talk. I uh, wanted to ask you about uh, the security manageability aspects that you, uh, you talked about. Yep. Um, it's been five or so years, uh, you know, uh, the NoSQL uh, players started showing up and uh, companies like us, you know, we, we always, uh, it, it's difficult to, to be in front of a customer to, uh, to say that, oh, we use uh, NoSQL, um, and especially if it's a financial institution. So where do you see the security and manageability uh, aspects get mature in two years, three years? What, is, what do you think? So I think that there's been a lot of progress even over the last 12 or 18 months, which has led to some of those early adopter wins with some of the financial institutions that I mentioned. And I know that we're working in close collaboration with, uh, with some of those financial institutions, some government agencies, et cetera, some health, folks in healthcare to create uh, not just the ability to build a secure system, but to make it easy and to make it, it you know, check all the boxes in a natural way that people will be comfortable. So I think you can do it today. I think it should be easy in, I would say, probably about a two year time frame. Okay, we have another question on the left and we're gonna take advantage of, of this little extra time to just do a swap of machine sure. front here. Okay, uh, appreciate you being here today and sharing with us uh, the, uh, what's going on in the world right now. I've been around in the consulting role for quite a while, and I've always run into people who hired me to come in and help them, but didn't want to implement the plan because it meant that they had to change the way they did things. Yep. The biggest thing I'm finding out with new technology is resistance uh, from people who don't want to learn anything new. They're, they're happy the way things are, but they don't want to rock the boat. This is what I see is going to be the biggest obstacle to the adoption of new technologies. Absolutely. I think uh, yeah, people come in a variety of flavors, right? And, and some are really excited to try the newest thing just because it's the newest. And then there are some who will use the newest thing if there's a demonstrable benefit to it. And then there are others that will use it only once it's really safe. And there are some who, even once it's really safe, won't want to use it, right? And so all, all we can do is create that benefit, lower the, those barriers, make sure that people hear about the successes that, the, that they're having, and, and the market will shift over time. I do think it shifts faster now than, than it did a, a couple of decades ago, and I think sometimes um, you benefit for, for people choosing things for the wrong reasons as well. When people think that this is gonna help me get a new job, then, then they're excited to learn it, whether it's useful or not. So it, it cuts both ways, but mostly it will slow us down. I, I, I agree. Okay, right. uh, we're gonna have to cut things short there, and I apologize to the other hands that are raised. Max, thanks very much for joining us. Really appreciate Thank it. Thank you.